Good morning, friends. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeff, if you haven't uh, seen me before on the internet. Um, uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Dungeons and the Dragons, my all-time favorite game. Now, this is more of an intro for those of you who are new to the game, uh, new players, new DMs, new anybody. How we're going to be going through this is I'm going to be explaining the character sheet just like from top to bottom, explaining where the numbers come from and how you would sort of reverse engineer these numbers. Um, <clears throat> so, we're going to start up here. See this little dragon friend? Uh, I don't remember his name. We're going to call him Ampersand the Dragon because he also makes up the Ampersand. So Ampersand friend here uh, is coiled around your character's name. Now... This is the only part of the pre-generated character sheets that come with the Lost Mind of Fandelver, which is the um, the intro starter set. Let's bring up an image of that quick. Lost Mind of Fandelver. So the starter set is going to look like, of course, I used the name of the thing, D&D starter set. So it's going to look like this. And it's going to run you like 14 bucks on Amazon. And it's really the best money you can spend on D&D these days. Look at all that stuff. You get dice, you get character sheets, you get an adventure. It's great. Anyway, so in there you get the uh, these character sheets. There's five of them. There's a human noble fighter. Uh, that, that character shtick is they use a great axe and they're a big strong fights person. Um, then there's also a Dwarf Cleric, because we are all about stereotypes here in starter sets. So the Dwarf Cleric is like a, an old sort of military person, like, I fought in the wars 20 years ago, I'm fucking tired of this. Kind of a, kind of a, yeah, one of them kind of things. So, uh, Cleric, and you've got a... Uh, halfling rogue, because again, the shortest person in the party should be the thief, as is tradition. Um, we've got a elf wizard, so again, falling back on tropes, but tropes are important sometimes. And last but not least, another fighter, in case you have a fifth character. Uh, this is more of an archery, like ranged character. They, they shoot mans with bows until the mans fall down. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go up to the top again, and we're going to look at the most basic character here, the human fighter that uses a axe. Now, axes, uh, axes are a good way to, to end someone's life, uh, obviously, as they've been used for thousands of years. But we're not going to get into that just yet. So let's start at the top again. So character name. That's where you put in the name of your, your person. Um, I don't have a form-fillable version of this, but uh, imagine we've just written... Uh, Aaron in there. This this character's name is Aaron, and she is a fightsman. So class, fighter. Uh, classes in D and D are kind of broad archetypes that tell you the skills you have, but they don't tell you what you are. If that makes any sense, like you can be a fighter. You could be a fighter your whole life. That's your your only class is fighter, but you describe yourself as a knight or a a samurai, or a mercenary, or a, uh, hell, I don't know, just like a soldier, basically. Um, a gladiator. These are all just descriptors. Fighter gives you the, the things you use to interact with the world. How you interact with them is up to you. Your background informs that a little bit more. So with a noble background, you get every background. Uh, there are like 20-something of them give you a, a couple of skills, some starting equipment, and a sort of special ability. The noble gives you position of privilege, which, if it would highlight properly, thanks to your noble birth, people are inclined to think the best of you. You're welcomed in high society, and people assume you have the right to be wherever you are. Much like in real life, if you just act like you belong, most people aren't going to ask you questions about it. So, common folk make every effort to accommodate every effort every effort to accommodate you and avoid your displeasure and other people of high birth treat you as a member of the same social sphere 
you can secure an audience with a local noble if you need to. Now this does come up a couple of times in the starter campaign actually, so handy power to have. Let's go continue back up here. Uh, race. Uh, now in in D and D and a lot of other games, race is closer analogous to like species than race as a social construct in in contemporary Earth culture. So this person is a human, uh, and they are lawful neutral. So alignment is another weird kludgy thing from D and D's past that we can't seem to get away from. But it's a useful tool to tell you how this pre-generated character operates, how they how they think. So it's made up of two components, ethics and morality. So your ethics uh, slider is lawful, neutral, and chaotic. Lawful characters want an orderly society. They like rules. They like structure. Neutral characters are good with whatever so long as no one is trying to actively oppress them. And chaotic characters think that uh, basically rules are stupid. Anybody who follows rules are stupid. And I'm going to be over there. Uh, on the moral uh, slider, you have good, neutral, and evil. Yes, this means there's some replication there between neutral and neutral. Um, in the event that you choose neutral on both of them, you are just listed as neutral once, not neutral, neutral. Again, another weird artifact. So, good characters are good people. They help other people out without expecting a reward, but they won't necessarily turn a reward down. Uh, neutral people will help others out, assuming there's something in it for them, or they're coerced. Uh, evil people will help other people out, but they will do it in the most kind of dickish way possible. So, this character's lawful neutral, which, um, the good anal uh, an analog, the I can't seem to talk today, sorry. Uh, another good analog for that is the kind of classical knight. They are very order focused they're very much these are the rules i will follow these rules these rules are what's best for the world um so i will act in a way that will hopefully draw other people to that set of rules that will draw them to the same conclusion that i've made so now that we've got this top bit oh yes player name your name goes there and experience points that starts at zero but you'll get some of those soon enough uh the next thing to worry about is your attributes these are all over here <coughs> So your attributes um, are the, the numbers that allow you to interact with the world. Strength is how big, strong, how, how lifty you are. Uh, the, the bigger the, the strength score here, uh, backing up a half step, all these small numbers here, they're like 16, 9, 15, 11, 13, 14. Um, these are all uh, on a scale of 3 to 18. So a three being like the weakest a human can be, and 18 being the strongest a human can be, uh, like here in Earth. So three would be someone who is cataclysmically underdeveloped. They are they're like basically just skin and bones. They can't really like they can't really affect the world by pushing on it basically up through 18, which is someone like... Uh, do you know the guy that plays the mountain in Game of Thrones? Hafthor Bjornsson. Massive wall of muscle and hugeness. He would have an 18 strength. Uh, dexterity is kind of your quickness and your ability to, to dodge away from things. Um, again, so 3 is like... Not paralyzed, but like everybody's 97-year-old great-grandmother would have like a 3 dexterity. Uh, and then an 18 would be like a gymnast. Um, constitution is your heartiness and your endurance. Also, uh, how, how much you can get punched without, you know, falling over. So a 3 would be somebody who's hospital-ridden, and an 18 would be someone who runs ultra-marathons for fun. Uh, intelligence is how, how smart you are. It's your... Um, it's your mental dexterity. It's how quick you are, how well you remember facts, that sort of thing. Wisdom is uh, your perceptiveness and your kind of world-wiseness. Um, it's your understanding of the world on a non-intellectual level. Things like medicine and uh, perception. 
and survival and animal handling all cue off of wisdom. So this is your um, insane anarchist to uh, yogi kind of slider here. And then charisma is your force of personality, how magnetic you are. Um, in previous editions of D&D, it, it also encompassed like physical beauty, but it's we've kind of gotten away from that over the last 10 years because there are, I don't know if you know this, but here in the real world, there are a lot of very pretty people who are just not, you don't want to interact with them. They're awful human beings. And you know that just from talking to them. So charisma is force of personality. It's your mental strength score. It's how much you can affect your will onto the world. So these big number, the, the smaller sized numbers are your ability scores. Um, part of the game is this kind of weird, like a 16 equals plus three, a nine equals a minus one. There's a chart in the, uh, in the, in the rule book that explains how it all works. But the short version is the math is whatever your score is. So for instance, if your score is a 12, you subtract 10 from whatever your score is and then divide the remainder by two rounding down. Now I know, lots of mathy gar garbage, but again, there's a chart. You don't really have to worry about any of that. Um, but these are the numbers that you add to things. So even though you have a 16 strength, you don't ever add that 16 to any rolls. It doesn't really come into play except for a couple of weird corner case rules that don't ever really come up. It's fine. The other thing that impacts how you interact with the world is your proficiency bonus. This is added to your attack rolls, your ability to hit things with weapons and spells that you're proficient with, as well as saving throws, which we'll get to in a second, and skills. If you are if you are proficient, if you're trained in a skill or a saving throw or with certain uh, certain types of weapons, you add that proficiency bonus because that is your skill level. That's how good you are with that. So, for instance, this is a fighter. So as a fighter, you are trained in uh, strength and constitution saving throws. So what are saving throws? Saving throws are your ability to kind of shake off effects, uh, lingering damage, your ability to resist things. So for instance, a strength saving throw would be someone tries to pick you up and throw you, and you're just like, Oh, no, you don't. So you, like, just root down and, you know, like, widen your stance and you fight back with your muscles. Uh, dexterity th saving throws would be getting out of the way of something like an explosion or a trap or falling into a pit. Uh, constitution saving throws are for things like resisting getting drunk, resisting poisons, uh, long-distance running, that sort of thing. Intelligent saves are for things like puzzles, um magical mazes, that kind of thing. Wisdom saves are generally used to resist charm effects um, or other things that assail your mind. And charisma saves are generally... that's. I think charisma and intelligence are the two least used saves. Charisma specifically is only used for a couple of very specific things. But when it comes up, it's really important. So it's like very swingy. Skills. Skills. Anyway. Uh, sorry, I got off track a little bit there. Saving throws, right. So as a fighter, your training hinged on uh, your strongness and your ability to like not let people push you around physically and also just building up a massive amount of endurance. So you get to add to strength saving throws. Since you're trained, you get to add your strength, which is three, proficiency bonus, which is two, and that gets you that five there. Constitution, same thing. Plus two, plus two, equals plus four. Anything you're not trained in, you just copy this into here, this into here, etc. Um, now, there are ways after you start playing the game to get trained in more saving throws, more skills, that sort of thing, but for now, we're not going to worry about that. Skills. So skills are ways to do things. So anything your character tries to do that affects someone else that isn't an attack roll or a spell probably uses a skill. So for instance, um, we'll look through the train skills first. So athletics, athletics is climbing, jumping, sprinting, swimming, that kind of thing. 
History is your knowledge of things that happened in the past, specifically historical junk. Uh, geography is usually rolled into this, as is like courtly rules, that sort of thing. Perception, this is your ability to spot, search, listen, taste, smell, all of your, your senses, how good you are at noticing things. Uh, persuasion, that's your ability to truthfully get people to believe you. Uh, so you walk into town, the gates are shut, there's a couple of guards there, you need to get into town because your mother is in town and she's very sick and you're bringing this medicine. <clears throat> So you would say, you would tell the guard that, you'd be like, My lord, I have been on the longest journey to find this medicine. My mother, she lives in this town and she is very, very sick. Please, I beg of you, I must get inside. I know that they have barred the gates for some unforeseen cataclysm, but we, we've traveled for so long to find this medicine. If you could just find it in your heart to let us in, please. Uh, then the DM would say, okay, roll Persuasion. So you would roll and you would add your Persuasion modifier, which is your Charisma score, or your Charisma modifier here, plus your Proficiency bonus, since you're trained in Persuasion. And hope you roll well. Um, the inverse of that would be Deception and Intimidation. So Deception would be, please, sir, my mother's in this town and I need to get this medicine to her, but really, it's a bag of drugs and you're going into town to sell it. It's all about intent. If you are deceiving them, if you're using falsitudes, or you're, you're making up stories uh, to, to get past a thing, use deception. If you're being truthful, you use persuasion. If you're trying to scare the shit out of them, intimidate. Intimidate would be you go up and you grab the guard by the collar, and you just yell in his face, let us in or I will cut your throat. Intimidate. Um, so, yeah. Skills work like saving throws in that you add the relevant skill. So like animal handling, for instance. Wisdom, so that's a plus one, not trained. Uh, history, you got a plus two for proficiency and a plus zero for intelligence, so that gets you a two. And uh, the last little knob down here is passive wisdom slash perception. So how this works is it's 10, which is slightly below, but basically the average on a d20 roll the 20-sided die being the most commonly used die in the game. It determines how any of these skill checks and saving throws work. Um, so it's 10 plus your perception. There is a math error on this. That is hilarious. So, oh no, there's not. I was reading the wrong line. That's persuasion. It's 13. So 10 plus your perception is 3. So that's 13. Sorry about that. Um, now that we're done with, oh, there is this other section down here. So proficiencies, this tells you what you add your proficiency bonus to in most cases, or um, other things that you can do that aren't skills. So you have, you're proficient with all armor. You can wear anything from cloth to a chain shirt to plate mail to like giant ridiculous full plate. Shields, so you can use bucklers, big shields, tower shields, everything. Simple weapons, which is anything that like a normal person could figure out how to use within like a day or two of training. Martial weapons, which are things that take several weeks of specialized training, and also playing cards, because you were uh, a noble and you were a bored noble, so you learned to gamble really well. Uh, languages is the languages you uh, read and speak. So you speak common, which is kind of the, uh, it's the lingua franca, it's the uh, for lack of better words and for lack of Eurocentrism, um, it's effectively English. The majority of the world understands, at least on some basic level, common. Now, that's how it's explained in the player's handbook. I prefer to think of common as more like a trade language that's just been cobbled together and stapled together from all these other things. And nobody speaks common at home. It's like emojis, basically. You can convey a lot of information with them, but subtlety is kind of lost with it. Um, draconic, which is the language of dragons, and dwarvish, which is the language of dwarves. If you need any more information about dwarves or dragons, I suggest reading The Hobbit. It's a good treatise on both of those. Uh, moving our way back up to the top, armor class. Armor class is how hard you are to hit in combat. This is a combination of the armor that you're wearing, training that you have, and uh, your dexterity if it's light armor or medium armor you're wearing. This character is wearing chainmail, 
which is a heavy armor. So Chainmail has an AC value of 15 by default. This character, uh, no, sorry, it is 17, because uh, this character does not have a shield. So, oh, that's where it's coming from. All right, so backing up a step. Chainmail, in the player's handbook, has uh, an AC value of 16. So, 16 plus fighting style defense. While you're wearing armor, you get a plus one bonus to AC. So that's how we get 17 here. Um, now, the, the dwarf down here has a higher armor class because they're using a shield instead of a two-handed weapon because you only have two hands. If you have two hands on your axe, you can't have a shield. Um, so if the, the attacker rolls their d20 and adds their bonus and it comes up to equal to or higher than 17, that means you get hit. That means they got slipped past your armor, they hit you between some chain links or something, and uh, you, you, you got some injuries. Uh, it could be bruising, it could be cutting, it could be bleeding. That depends on how many hit points you have left after the attack, basically. Uh, initiative, this is how quickly you react to combat. So at the beginning of each combat, you roll your 20-sided die and you add your initiative score. So in this case, it's a 1. So I roll... I get a seven. So seven minus one is six. My initiative is six. Generally speaking, the DM will start off the combat by telling everyone to roll initiative, pausing for a moment, and then saying, does anybody have 20 or above? If nobody says anything, 15 or above. Nobody says anything, 10 or above? Five or above, and so on. Um, now, the, the DM will also roll initiative for any monsters in this. I like to pre-roll the initiative of the monsters. So, like, in a uh, in an adventure that I'm running, say there is an encounter coming up that has a bunch of goblins in it. So there's four regular little grunty, annoying goblins, and then one goblin who is, like, their, their drill sergeant kind of character. They're not their, not their chief, but their, um, their, like, war leader. So you've got a total of five goblins, but they're operating as two different initiatives. You've got the four that are just goblins. These guys have like three hit points. They're basically trash. Uh, and then there's the leader who has maybe 20. They act on two different initiatives. You roll them separately. Um, since I know I'm going to be having this encounter, I will roll those out before the game starts uh, and just notate them in there that goblins go on 12, goblin leader goes on nine, and then fill the players in uh, afterwards, once they've rolled. So during combat, you go through your initiative chart. At the beginning of each round, you start at whatever the highest initiative rolled is. So let's say, for instance, this fighter uh, rolled a 7, so they have a 6 initiative score. But the rogue rolled a 19, and they have a plus 3 initiative. So they get to go at 22. So 22 starts... <laughs> And uh, the rogue takes their turn. And then you go through the initiative order, and no one rolled high. Everyone rolled really low for the players. So you get down to 12. All four of those regular-ass goblins go. And then 10, the cleric goes. And then 9, the goblin war leader goes. And then 6, the fighter goes. 2, the, uh, the wizard goes. And then once everyone has had a turn, you go back up to the top of the order and do the whole thing again. Most combats at low levels will go for three to five rounds at most, um, unless you're fighting something that exists just to be a damage sponge, like most dragons are. They're a thing that's a giant bag of hit points that's also really hard to hit. So, um, that's initiative and also a very basic form of combat. Speed. Now, speed is a bit of a sticking point for some players, because... There are people like me who run everything on a battle map, which is a grid of one-inch squares that I have little minis that I move around, and that shows you the relative positioning of all the different things that are going on. So in my case, that 30 feet is really six squares, because each one-inch square is five feet. Um, for some people, they do what's called theater of the mind combat, which is where they don't have a battle grid, and they just kind of describe where everyone is in relation to each other, and in those sort of games, the speed rating only really comes in during like tense chase situations. People can generally move wherever they want to. Um, this is determined by your race. So humans have a base speed of 30 feet. 
since this character isn't wearing super heavy armor, um, they're just wearing uh, chainmail, they don't lose any speed. So, next thing, hit points. Now, hit points are your, I mean, if you've played video games, you understand vaguely what hit points are. In D&D, they're a combination of luck, skill, uh, fortitude, and just straight up meat. So, 12 hit points means that you can take approximately three successful attacks before you are reduced to zero. Um, when your hit points are reduced to zero, uh, you fall unconscious and you start having to make death saves, which is you roll a d20 and hope you get 10 or higher. Um, but we'll go into that later at the death save section. So your hit point maximum is at this level. That is the maximum number of hit points I have. I start out with that much every morning when I wake up. Um, when you take damage, your hit point maximum stays the same, but your current hit points, which is this big blank white space here, um, go down. So if you get hit for one of those goblins stabs you and you take five damage, you, you start off with 12 in your current hit points and you reduce that to seven. Um, if the cleric then comes by and heals you for 10, uh, you only go up to 12. You do not overheal up to 17. Um, temporary hit points are a kludgy thing that we can't really get into at this point. Uh, they don't really come up until around level 3 to 6, depending on the class that you're playing. Uh, but basically, they are ways for you to go over that current hit point maximum. Temporary hit points are always lost first, before you take any damage to your current hit points. Hit dice are your self-heal. They're how you... like. When you bandage your wounds after a fight, they're how you recover hit points without magic or potions or that kind of thing. So at this level, you have one 10-sided die, um, which you can roll anytime you take a short rest. So after you get done fighting these goblins, the group sits down and starts bandaging their wounds. Now, the cleric has already used two of his three spells for the day, so he doesn't want to use that last heal right now because nobody's really that bad off. So, as we discussed earlier, your fighter has taken 5 points of damage, so you're at 7 hit points. Eric, okay. I'm going to spend my hit die. So you would, uh, under here where it says hit dice, you would write 1 at the beginning of the day. Erase that, turn it into a 0. Roll a 10-sided die and add that number plus your constitution modifier, which is over here, to your hit points. So you roll a 4, you add 2, that's a 6. 6 would put you at 13, so you only go up to 12. Uh, you get these back at the at the end of the day when you rest. You take a long rest, which is eight hours, as opposed to a short rest, which is one hour. Uh, if you camp overnight, basically, you regain one half of your hit dice, rounded up. So at this level, you'd regain one. At level 20, if you'd spent all your hit dice, you would regain 10 every time you sleep. Um, and again, your hit dice can never exceed, like your total accumulated hit dice will never exceed your level. Death saves. This is how you deal with uh, almost nearly dying. So if you're at zero, you're bleeding out. You're laying on the ground. You have no hit points left. You are unconscious, and who knows if you're going to make it. So every turn when your initiative comes up, you roll a 20-sided die, and if it's 10 or higher, you mark a, a check in the successes box here. If you roll a 9 or lower, you mark a failure. If the only other real exclusions to that are if you roll a 20, you immediately regain one hit point, so you are back awake. Uh, you're not on your feet, you're still laying in the dirt, but you are alive and you don't have to make any more death, so throws, death saving throws because you are still above zero. Uh, if you roll a one, it counts as two failures. So you would take off two of these. If you get to three failures before you get to three successes, your character is dead. They have Their heart has gave out, and they are no longer alive. Now, your fellows uh, can cast he healing spells on you to, to restore your hit points. They can make uh, medicine checks to try to stabilize you, uh, and the difficulties and stuff, all the rules for that are all covered in the book specifically, uh, and are kind of outside the scope of this. So next, this is your weapons, and sometimes attack spells. This is the, the, the most used box other than probably hit points on the sheet for most games. Um, some people run a much more combat light game or non-combat focused, like social focused game, or I've even run games where 
we've gone six weeks without a combat because it was just like basically merchants and manticores. Um, anyway, so each of your weapons gets its own line. This character has a great axe and a javelin for their two weapons. Um, most characters start off with one or two, sometimes in very rare cases, three weapons. Just uh, to keep everybody about on the same page. So this character's got a great axe. The attack bonus for a great axe is, since it's a melee weapon, and it's like a, a big heavy melee weapon, you add your proficiency bonus and your strength score. So three plus two is five. The damage, uh, that comes from the player's handbook. There's a chart for that as well. It's about this big. So you look at the great axe line. It says it's a two-handed weapon. It deals slashing damage. So it's cutting, not stabbing or bludgeoning. So slashing damage, and it does 1d12, so a 12-sided die. That's the little soccer ball-looking one. Uh, and you add 3, which is your strength modifier, when you hit. So you roll a d20, and you add 5. That is your attack bonus. If you beat, or sorry, if you meet or beat the enemy's AC, you have hit them. And then you roll a d12, and you add 3. And whatever that roll is, you say 8 slashing damage, or 4 slashing damage, or whatever. Or, ha 15! Uh, on your attack, if the 20-sided die sh uh, rolls and it gets a 20, which in the game of parlance is referred to as a natural 20, uh, it's what's called a critical hit. You roll twice as many dice for the attack. So in this case, you would roll two 12-sided dice and add six. So up to and including, what is that, 30 damage? 30 damage is a good number of damage, considering at level one, most monsters have like I don't know, like 12, 13 hit points? It's a good time. So, javelins. These are shorter spears that uh, you only throw. You can't really use them in melee. Uh, since it's a thrown weapon, though, you still get to use your strength score. So it's strength plus 3, plus your proficiency bonus of 2, gives you a 5. A javelin only does a d6 of damage, so like the squarey ones that you use in like Monopoly and stuff. Uh, you roll one of those and add 3. So you roll, you get a 2, you add 3, that's 5. So you tell the DM, 5 piercing damage. And the DM marks it off on the sheet for the monsters. Um, you can throw a javelin up to 30 feet or add up to 120 feet with disadvantage on the attack roll. So what's disadvantage? Well, in prior editions of D&D, &D, there was so much more math. Every little attack would have, like, plus 2 bonus from this, plus 5 bonus from this, minus 2 penalty from this, plus six from this, minus one from this, and you'd have to write it all, like, math it all out all the time, and it got really annoying. So instead of all those little tiny bonuses that added or subtracted from each other and basically canceled each other out in the long run, they developed the advantage and disadvantage system. So when you have advantage on attack roll or disadvantage, you roll two 20-sided dice, and in the case of disadvantage, you would take whichever number is lower. So if you roll a 19 and a six, you take the six. On advantage, it's the other way around. You roll two dice, and you take the higher one. I guess, I think technically advantage says you may take the higher one. You don't actually have to if you are, like, fighting a friend and you don't want to murder them because you roll a 20. You're like, I'm going to take this 12 instead. It's still going to hit, but it's not going to murder you. It's always a good time. Um, so you can throw a javelin 30 feet normally, or you can throw up to 120 feet with disadvantage. So you roll two dice, and you take the lower of the two values. So most, more likely than not, that javelin's probably going to miss at 100 feet. But then again, most people can't hit a target that's 100 feet away with a javelin. The next bit is your gear. Um, this, just deter this is like all the stuff you own in the world, or rather all the stuff that's pertinent to this that you own in the world. So you have your chainmail, you have a great axe, three javelins, a backpack, a blanket, a tinderbox, which is like a Altoids-sized can uh, that has flint steel and uh, like shredded wood pulp to act as tinder. It's used for starting fires. Uh, two days of trail rations. Rations in this are kind of like a calorie mate or like a super dense um, nutrition bar, basically. You get one of those and like some hard cheese and some nuts and uh, you know enough food to last you for the day. Uh, each of those takes up a space about the size of a Big Mac box. Um, a water skin, which is a one liter container, usually made out of um, like animal products. Um, some cultures use like fire hardened clay or gourds. 
um, or even like a metal canteen if you are very, very well off. Uh, a set of fine clothes, which would be like a tunic and an overrobe and nice pants and nice shoes um, or a very nice dress, however your character rolls. A signet ring, um, which is the kind that you would use to like put your stamp in a wax seal. And a scroll of pedigree, which if you've seen um, the Heath Ledger star vehicle, uh, why can't I remember that? The one with the knights. Anyway, that movie. The scroll of pedigree is like, here are all of a knight's tale, by the way. Here are all of my ancestors and why I'm important. Um, a lot of these things don't come up a lot for some games, um, but if you are a person who is really into that historical accuracy, you could require that the noble show their scroll of pedigree anytime they try to use their position of privilege to secure an audience with a local noble. Um, your character also has 25 gold. Um, so money in D&D is kind of like it is in a lot of video games. You start off the, the lowest tier is copper pieces. They're equivalent to, when we did the math, they're equivalent to like a dollar, basically. Silver pieces are a tenner. Uh, so they're worth 10 copper pieces. Electrum pieces are worth 50 copper or five silver pieces or half a gold. So they are a $50 bill. Gold pieces are a $100 bill and platinum pieces would be a $1,000 bill. That kind of gives you an idea of your character is carrying uh, $2,500 worth of monies, basically. Um, so like a long sword, like a good quality long sword is like 10 gold or a thousand dollars it's not a good it's not a perfect one-to-one -one system but it's better than the traditional like a copper is a penny a silver is a dime a gold is a dollar kind of thing because gold pieces are not a thing that normal people deal with the average person mostly deals in silver pieces and copper pieces like in real life how often do you carry around a stack of hundred dollar bills i know i don't because i'm broke as fuck so that's, that's what this is. You add and subtract money as you earn or spend it, as the case may be. Uh, if, you notice on the, uh, if you notice adjacent to this chainmail, there's this little tiny uh, asterisk here. So we go down here. While wearing this armor, you have disadvantage on stealth checks. Since chainmail is heavy, you aren't as sneaky while wearing it. The next section, this is entirely optional. This is basic personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. These are ways, like cues for you how this character plays out if you're playing it like originally described. So personality includes my flattery makes those I talk to feel wonderful and important. Also, I don't like to get dirty and I won't be caught dead in unsuitable accommodations. So this is the type of character who very much is like, I am a noble and fuck you. Uh, they don't want to get dirty. They don't like to dig ditches. They don't like, when they're out adventuring, they're the kind of person who has, like, their bedroll and a blanket, and they make sure to, like, brush it off every time they use it. If there's, like, sticks, they make sure there's no bugs. Uh, ideals. Responsibility. It's the duty of a noble to protect the common people, not to bully them. So they're a good noble, they're just annoying. Bonds. My great axe is a family heirloom, and it's by far my most precious possession. That means, as a DM, you're going to want to make them... Worry about that a little bit, but don't actually do anything to, re like, remove it from them. Like, make, you know, like the second or third time they're in combat, have a an, an ogre try to wrest the, the axe away from them. So they make a strength save, and then whatever they get, so long as it's, like, above 10, they succeed. Look at that. You've got your axe still, but that guy tried to take it because it looks so nice. It makes them value their their history, basically. Flaws. I have a hard time resisting the allure of wealth, especially gold. Wealth can help me restore my legacy. So with that clue, we know that this character comes from a noble house, but something went wrong. Some shit went sideways. Now, on the next page, it goes into detail about what that shit is, but we're not there yet. And we're probably not actually going to get there uh, during this uh, little exposition because we've already been doing this for like 40 minutes. Um, anyway, second wind. These are, your, these are your special abilities. These are the things that make you special, different from the other players. Second Wind. You have a limited well of stamina you can draw in to protect yourself from harm. You can use a bonus action. Backing up for a second. During each round of combat, everybody can do basically three and a half things. Three and a half. You can take an action 
which is anything that interacts with the world at large generally. Attacking, uh, using a skill, casting a spell, most of those take an action. You can move, which is you can uh, move up to your speed. Um, uh, you just move around. And a bonus action, if you have something that allows you to spend it. You can't... Um, in general, people don't have a way to spend a bonus action unless they have a class feature or a, a spell or a special ability that says use a bonus action too. So you can use a bonus action on your turn to regain hit points equal to a 10-sided die plus your fighter level. So you get hit, and you're like, crap, I'm not doing too well. The cleric's all the way over there. I'm going to just like do the Kylo Ren, like hit yourself in the wound or like um, the, the old, the old standby is the, um, like in action movies, the guy fires a gun and like jams the barrel against a bullet wound to seal it shut. That's what second wind is basically. Or like cowering behind a rock, heavily breathing, like set your shoulder back in. Uh, once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. So once you've done that, if you're, if you only have like five minutes between this fight and the next fight, you can't use it again that next fight. You have to take an hour to, like, drink something, eat some food, relax, bind your wounds, basically chill out. Um, or a long rest, which is overnight. Fighting style, defense. While you are wearing armor, you get a plus one bonus to AC. This is already included in your armor calculation. So, basically, your character was trained from a young age to be... A defensive fighter. They know how to block very well. They know how to interpose their armor. So they see a sword is going to get past their axe and their shield. So they know how to like pivot to bring their armor to bear to have the, sh the uh, shot most likely ricochet off. And we already covered position of privilege. So that was a lot of stuff. But this is condensing, what is 2014? This is three and some days, or three years and some days of D&D &D condensed into less than an hour. Second page um, is in these, basically just breaks down what happens when you get, when this character gains levels, what being a human is about, uh, what being a fighter is about, and what this character's background is. So they have a goal and an alignment. So their goal is to civilize Phandalin. You were meant for more than being a ruler of nothing at all. Rebuilding Corlin Hill is impractical thanks to the volcano. Apparently there's a volcano. But in the last three or four years, hardy settlers have been rebuilding another ruin near the city, the old town of Phandalin, which orcs sacked five centuries ago. It's a long time. Clearly, what Phandalin needs now is a civilized influence. Someone to take the reins and bring law and order. Someone like you. You're not the only one with such ideas. A knight named Sildar Hallwinter, uh, that's an NPC, um, they play a not insubstantial role in the story. Recently set out for Phandalin in the company of a dwarf named Gundren Rockseeker. They plan to reclaim an ancient mine and restore Phandalin to a civilized center of wealth and prosperity. Since your goals align, Hallwinter should be assisting or should be willing to assist you. So, so long as you are working to re, uh, towards civilizing Phandalin, most likely Sildar is going to be like, "This lady is a good dude. We're going to work together. It's going to be great." And alignment, lawful neutral. It's essential to establish law and order, even if it takes an iron fist to do so. The nobility are bound by honor and tradition to protect the people from both external and internal threats to stability. An organized society leaves no room for evil and chaos to take root. So that's good. Um, gaining levels. As you gain XP, uh, as you adventure and overcome challenges, you gain XP. So defeating monsters, solving puzzles, uh, helping out NPCs, all things that can get you XP. It's all explained further in the rule book. With each level you gain, you gain an additional hit die. So your hit dice goes from 1d10 to 2d10. And your maximum hit points goes up by 1d10 plus 2. Um, now, there's two ways to do this. In the Player's Handbook, um, and I believe Lost Mine of Phandelver, it gives you the option of either taking the average on that d10, which is a 6, or rolling the d10. You choose before you, like when you choose, that's before you've made that roll. So you're like, I'm going to I'm gonna risk it. I'm going to roll this d10. So you roll the d10, and you get a 4. And you add 2, and that's 6. Cool. You still come out slightly behind, because the 6 would have also got the plus 2. 
from your constitution score. Let's back up a step here. So adding that 1d10 plus 2. That plus 2 comes from your constitution modifier. Uh, and if this is a negative number, you can uh, have to subtract from that uh, die. You always gain at least one hit point every level. Even if you are a wizard with a minus three constitution, you are the sickliest, frailest person in the world. No matter what, when you go up a level, you gain at least one hit point. When you've reached 300 experience, you get to second level. So you gain the action surge ability. You can push yourself beyond normal limits for a moment. On your turn, you can take an additional action on top of your regular action and possible bonus action. So you can be like, it's your adrenaline surge. It's your ability to just like, you know, you swing your axe and then you see an opening and you spend your action surge and you bring your axe back up and try to cut them again. Or uh, cast, an, cast an additional spell if you're a fighter wizard, but we won't get into that. That's too complicated. Anyway, so it basically will get you like an extra attack, or you can use it to shove someone, or you can use it to, um, if you're in a chase, for instance, and both you and the person you're trying to chase have a speed of 30, you can use your movement to move 30, and then you can use your action to dash, which is you move again, basically. So you move, and you move again. That's 60 feet, but he does the same thing. That's also 60 feet. So you use your action surge to get another 30 feet and catch up to him. Uh, at third level, when you've reached reach 900 XP, which is cumulative, just in case there was any kind of confusion there, it after you get to this 300 XP, it doesn't then reset back to zero. You stay at 300 XP. Once you get to a total of 900, you get improved critical. Your weapon attacks score a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20. So previously, you had to roll a 20 to get that double damage. But now, if you roll a 19 or a 20, you get that double damage. Level 4, your strength score goes up because you've been hitting the weights. You do even lift, bro. Strength modifier becomes a plus 4. Your attack bonus and damage for strength-based attacks, such as your Great Axe and Javelin, increase by 1. Your modifier to strength saving throws increases by 1. And your modifier to athletics increases by 1. At 5th level, which, or sorry, at 4th level is 2700 XP, and 5th level is 6500 XP. The game does go up to 20th level, which gets you to, like, a, a lot of XP. I think it's in the hundreds of thousands. But the scope of the starter set is 1 through 5. Most groups don't even make it 2, 5 in the starter set because you can technically... I think I saw a group beat it at level 2 in like a speed run sort of situation. But So, you get extra attack. Whenever you take the attack action on your turn, you make 2 attacks instead of 1, which means if you use action surge, you make 4 attacks on that turn, which makes you basically a one-woman wrecking crew. Your proficiency bonus increases to plus 3, which has the following effects and it lists those effects. Uh, and improving your armor. As you acquire treasure, you can buy better armor to improve your armor class. The rule books contain equipment, including armor. So you get back to town after you've amassed a reasonable amount of, of money. You just got second level. You're like feeling really good about yourself. You're like I've been eyeing that plate armor in the window of the blacksmith shop for like the past two weeks. I'm going to buy it. So you walk in there with your sack of money and you drop it on the counter and you wait a couple days because they have to resize the armor to fit you if you're going for a realistic sort of thing. If you're going for more of a casual video gamey feel, it just happens to fit you automatically. It really works great. So you put that armor on and that would increase your armor class up here. Um, so that is, that is the character sheet. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, if it hasn't been helpful, then I'm sorry. Feel free to uh, message me with any questions that you have. Um, thank you so much, and uh, have, have, have a lovely day.